Thank you so much for tuning tuning in. We are live again. Um, we are live today on LinkedIn and on YouTube and also on my podcast. So thank you so much for joining. The last uh, few live streams I've done were extremely successful. We had between 20 and 25,000 people um, live watching it. So this is so exciting to see you all here. So thank you for joining. Um, let me just make sure my live stream is open so I can see all your comments. What we want to do in this session is this is the the second session uh, on my new book called Tech Trends in Practice. Um, in this book, I talk about the, the 25 biggest technology trends that will really define the next 10 years or so and are the foundation for this new uh, fourth industrial revolution. So what um, I'm doing in, in this podcast to, to look at the next five technology trends. So today we'll talk about um, blockchain technology. We'll talk about extended reality, which includes AR, VR and, and mixed reality. And then we talk about edge and cloud computing, as well as digital twins and natural language processing. So what I want to do is to give you an outline um, of uh, the, the those five trends, and then I will hopefully answer as many questions as possible. It's so nice, I now have all of your comments in my uh, StreamYard platform, so I can actually don't have to worry about opening a separate platform. So Rahab, I see Philippe, Nada, uh, I see Penny again. Hi, Penny, um, Jerry, uh, Manu, so thank you so much, all candies. Hi, uh, Mona, you've asked a question, which I hopefully will try to answer later. Thank you. Uh, John, hi, uh, Marco, Ross. Um, I've got Marco from Brazil. Let me know where you're from. This gives me a really good feel of, of who's on the, st on the stream. Um, Natty from South Africa, um, Rocky from South Africa. Um, quite a few people from South Africa. We've got Thomas from Atlanta, uh, Abdul from Pakistan, so Mona from Iran, Emily from Dallas. So really good to see you all here. Um, what if you want to ever watch a, a re-recording of these live streams? They are they will all sit on my YouTube channel. And what you can do also is you can watch any of the previous episodes. So if you want to look back at some of the trends I talked about last time, like um, artificial intelligence and others, you can go to, to the first uh, live stream on, on the book. So today we will talk about blockchain. And again, this is something that I've, it's a topic I've written about quite a lot in my Forbes column. I have written um, articles on, on blockchain and I've done a few videos. I don't know whether you've seen my most recent interview uh, on on blockchain on my channel. So if you want to dive into in any more depth, feel free to, to have a look around. So blockchain basically is the, the first key trend that I want to talk about and blockchain in distributed ledger technologies. And there's a lot of hype around blockchain. Lots of people think that blockchain is equivalent with Bitcoin, which it is not, but I will explain this in a minute. And basically blockchain in its simple terms is a way of storing data. So we are trying to store data or records or transactions. So it's basically a digital ledger, a bit like a database. What makes a difference is that, that every change in this digital ledger or in this record or then in, in this data set that is made is time stamped and um, date stamped and a new block is formed with this new change transaction. So what this means is you're ch creating a chain of individual data blocks and therefore it gives you a track record of how this record has been changed over time. The other thing that make, makes blockchain different from traditional databases is that it is distributed. That means that the data is duplicated across lots of different computers. And when, whenever a change is made in this blockchain, 
the change is made on all the different duplicates. And the other thing that is happening is that there is a verification process. So, this, and this can be done by consensus, which means we have a public blockchain where every computer that's part of this blockchain has to verify this, or we can have a, a private blockchain. So the third component of blockchain is that it's pretty safe because of this distributed nature and because of the cryptology that sits behind it. So everyone basically has a key, a bit like key to your house, but you have a, a, a private key to your blockchain information. And if you are able to make changes to this blockchain, you hold this key. So a really good example for me to illustrate this because it's quite theoretical is if you think about healthcare records, yeah? So if you think about that you have healthcare information, all your diagnosis that your doctor made could be, hold, could be held in a blockchain. And I now have the private key to this. So I can make, I can give people permission to access it. So I can give their public key a permission to view my information so I can share this information with my doctor. But for example, if I then end up in a hospital in a different country, I can also give this um, hospital information to this uh, access to this information if I wanted to. And so I can use my private key to not only make changes, but I can also give people access to it or revoke access to it. So, and hopefully you can see that there are huge implications for all of this, because what this means is that we could, in many instances, have this possibility to disintermediate some of the central functions of, of organizations like banks, yeah? Banks basically hold a central ledger and they're controlling it. So if all your money is stored in their database, you then make a transaction to someone else and the bank then verifies it. So they're the middleman, the trusted middleman. In theory, if we have blockchain technology, we don't need the middleman because we are trusting the system, the safety, the distributed nature of this information, and this was the foundation of, of this whole Bitcoin currency. So blockchain is the technology that underpins Bitcoin, okay? But it is now so much more. We now have lots of different types of blockchains. This is another uh, misconception that people think there's one blockchain, there are hundreds of different blockchains. People come up with new blockchains all the time, and there are now lots of different versions of it that are all competing with each other. And the and instead of just storing simple information like how much of bit of the Bitcoin currency I have, I can now use it to have intelligent smart contracts, for example. So I can build into my blockchain saying, okay, if this certain criteria is met and I confirm, let's say I I um I'm I want to listen to a song by a new artist. I can then download this song, my computer can register that I have listened to it, and if this happens, I will automatically pay um, the, the artist for this music. So there are companies like Mycelia, which are basically have set up a, a blockchain platform for music, which is very interesting. Um, companies like Kodak have created Kodak Coin, so this is basically their own Bitcoin, Bit uh, uh, their, their own um, digital currency for payments for photo licensing. So if someone uses a photograph online, for example, if I use the photo I've just embedded here in my presentation, someone owns the copyright. At the moment, I went to a, um, a service, I bought the rights to use this photograph, but in the future, I could just simply download this and my account could be charged for this if there is copyright associated with this. So there are lots of interesting applications and um, com even countries, uh, companies like Facebook are now trying to build their own cryptocurrency. So they are quite trying to create a Libra um, cryptocurrency that en enables them to, um, or enables any use then to, to make payments with someone else. So for me, blockchain has real hope, has real promise. Lots of people believe that 
it is it could be as powerful as the internet was in the past for trusted uh, transactions and for me medical records is a great example another really good example is passport information there are now a number of countries that are now moving some of their information to the blockchain these are not public blockchains but private blockchains so the the public blockchain is what we call a permissionless prop blockchain so the bitcoin blockchain anyone can join and have a copy of bitcoin on it and they can transact if they have an account the permissioned blockchain a private blockchain where you still have a central authority that grants people access and manages it so this when we go into this digital ledger territory so blockchain sometimes have a has a negative term uh, negative negative connotation so lots of companies are now talking about digital ledgers and and for me there are opportunities if you think about passport information. At the moment, I find this pretty crazy. When I travel to another country, I have to carry my passport around, right? And if I lost my passport on my travels, I'm not allowed to go on the plane. I can't enter the country. I can't leave the country. Wouldn't it be a great idea if my um, information and my biometrics are all stored in a blockchain kind of system that all border agencies have access to, and I simply walk in and out of airport terminals and in and out of countries, uh, and this is all done automatically. Um, companies like Walmart are also experimenting with blockchain for their supply chain security. So I've, I've written about examples where, for example, a, a tuna fishing company now stores um, everything on the blockchain. So when they catch a tuna, they can demonstrate this was caught in a very sustainable way. They log this geographically, geostamp it. This goes onto the blockchain. When this is then put into uh, a can, this is again stamped. And basically, when you buy something at the end, you can simply scan the barcode and you can trace where this product has come from. Companies like De Beers are using this for their diamonds because there's been... Um, a fear about blood diamonds and are they really coming from sustainable sources and are they ethically uh, produced and again they have now started to record the diamond has been mined it has then been cut it's then been turned into a piece of jewelry and then sold and what is even more interesting because diamonds are unique if i have a dime a photo of this diamond diamond in a database in this blockchain I can then verify that I, ought, I own this. So anyone who wants to potentially sell this in the future can't do this because I, I'm the confirmed owner on this blockchain. So real implications, real promise. The challenge is that it is still in its infancy. So there's lots of um, challenges around this. Um, there are too many competing blockchains. There are no standards around this. And there are some political challenges as well, because some of the authorities, in their, it's in their interest to see some of these cryptocurrencies fail. Because just imagine, at the moment, it is our central banks that can determine uh, interest, ra interest rates, that control uh, our economy. If companies like Facebook now come up with a completely new cryptocurrency and everyone starts using it, it basically disintermediates um, central banks and others. So some real implications there. And there's no standards, lots of competing chain, and there's an environmental impact as well. Um, I think just looking back at some of the questions here, Julie from Australia was asking the uptake, uptake of block, blockchain and distributed ledger tech as, as, as this increases, the energy needed to power it also increases. So is this really sustainable? And this is a, a, a real problem for the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain, for example, because this is a public blockchain that uses lots of energy and we have thousands, millions of computers across the world, huge data centers that are now running Bitcoin. And last year, the Bitcoin network alone used about 30 terawatts of data, which to put this into context, the entire country of Ireland used only 24 terawatt, terawatts. So this is absolutely not sustainable. What is What we're seeing is at the moment is that lot of these data centers that mine Bitcoin and run it are in places like Iceland that are 
fuel on and and uh, they they use the energy from um, green sources. The challenge is that I see is that at the moment we could use this computer power for lots of better things. So, however, having said this, innovations are happening every day. There are new blockchain, much more energy efficient blockchains being developed. So I have hope that this will become more sustainable in the future. Okay, let's have a quick look across my live stream. It's so nice to see the comments all here now. Um, Okay, I've got Kuba from Nepal. Hi, really good to see you. Um, I have Bhuvanesh from the United Arab Emirates. Um, Karen, hi. Um, I've got Bob, Sabine, Jonathan from Paris. Lovely to see you. I've got Kalias from India and uh, Michael from Washington. Really good to see you. Thank you so much for for tuning in. So this was the first one, blockchain. Let's move to the, the next one, which is extended reality. So this is the, another trend I talk about in my book and a, a really important technology trend. So what we're seeing is that we're now able to extend our reality into the digital world and we're trying to create more immersive digital experiences. So when I talk about extended reality, what this basically includes is um, virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. So what we see Basically, when, 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 we, when we talk about virtual reality is where you are wearing a headset and you completely immerse yourself in the digital world. So you wear um, glasses like the Ocul Oculus Rift or the HTC Vive or the Samsung Gear and you put them on, you can't see anything else and everything you, you see is the virtual world. And we've seen this in, in, in gaming, for example, but we're also seeing this now in education where this has a big impact. So because we can now cre create new um, education experiences. So it's all well and good describing what age, ancient Greek cities looked like, but now you can put those glasses on little children and they can actually explore, they can walk around, they can really immerse themselves in it. Um, or if you want to walk with dinosaurs, you can now do this. So this is an, an amazing opportunity. The the second one is augmented reality. And this for me has probably the one of the biggest promise, is the, 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 the most promising technology because we're using, we don't have to wear any headsets. We simply use our mobile phones or smartphones or we use tablets or we can even use a, a web browser, a web interface or any displays or smart glasses. And for me, Instagram filters are the perfect example of augmented reality. So you simply video yourself and then it puts some nice little ears onto you or, or changes your, your hair color or puts some emojis around you. Pokemon Go was the first application that lots of people got used to. But for me, it has real implications. And if I if you look at what Apple and Samsung are now doing with their smartphone, this is all about augmented reality. Um, if you have one of the latest iPhones, have a look on the, on the Apple website, for example, because you can now view all of their products in augmented reality. So you can simply place, you can use your phone, you can place the latest Apple product into your front room, into your kitchen, and you can walk around it and zoom in and zoom out and really have a much better feel for the product. And uh, lots of applications, obviously. So the technology is now being embedded into those products. It's, there are lots of APIs that will make it easy. And companies like Burger King have come up with a great example. So what they're now doing is they're using this for customer engagement. So basically they basi have de developed this app that allows you to use the camera of your phone to scan a, a rival uh, ad. So if you see an ad for McDonald's, for example, the app would automatically recognize it. Then you can press a button to burn this ad, this ad so you see the, the Big Mac going off in flames 
And as a reward, you then get um, send a voucher for a Whopper. And then Burger King, the Burger King app can even take you and direct you to the nearest Burger King. So this is, for me, a really cool example. Other examples include IKEA's Place app. So if you are interested in buying IKEA furniture, you can now simply sit in your front room, download the app, and place IKEA items into your room to see what, the, what, what this will actually look like. Or Dulux, the paint manufacturer, what they are now doing is they have designed a, an app that allows you to try out wall colors. So if you want to say, what does my room look like if I painted it with this Dulux color, green or red or, or whatever colors they have, you can simply see what this actually looks like. So for me, real implications. We, I've seen great apps in cosmetics, for example, where you can try Try, try on different shades of blushes where you can try new makeup styles uh, a bit like the 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 filters on, on on your instagram or you can try new hairstyles if you go to your hairdresser why not use an app to try out what it will actually look like to have different haircuts or we have 10 Streets Head is a, is a company I've written about. They are uh, allowing you to try on hats um, using either the phone or their website. Or I've done some work with the Rolex, Rolex where you can now try on Rolex watches on your wrist. And again, this is something you can see on my channel on YouTube if you're interested in. And companies, companies like um, like Gatwick Airport, the airport in the in, in London is now using an app that guides people through the airport. So you simply use your smartphone, it can direct you to your gate. Um, I've now seen this in car windscreens too. So at the moment, our satellite light navigation, for example, is built into a little screen that is usually next to our steering wheel. In the future, we'll have smart windscreens that simply tell us where to go without being distracted by a sat-nav. So overlaying this onto the real world, this is what, um, what, what augmented reality does. Possibly the most exciting area is what is now termed mixed reality. So this is an extension of augmented reality and you wear glasses, but you don't wear glasses that take away the, 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 the real world. You're blending the real world with um, the digital world. And what is different is in augmented reality, you can place objects onto the real world and you can see what an IKEA bit of furniture looks like. In mixed reality, you can interact with this. You can manipulate it. So you're, you're where, where objects, digital objects can interact with the, the real world, which is pretty epic. So um, things like... Um, Microsoft HoloLens, for example, or the Magic Leap glasses are offering this technology. And one of the coolest examples I've seen is being able to play the drums digitally. So you basically place a drum kit in front of you, you place digital sticks into your hand, you start playing, and you can actually hear what it sounds like. So again, huge opportunities in education and other areas. Very good. Um, let's have a quick look at my stream. I've got um, Jonathan from Paris. I've got uh, Jasbir from Malaysia. Really good to see you. Uh, Cuba from Nepal. Um, okay. Lots of kind comments. Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. I've got uh, Jiga from India, Priscilla from Canada. Thank you so much for joining in. Feel free to ask questions. What I will do with all of these live streams is I won't be able to answer all of those questions. If you have a question that you really want to have an answer to, what I do every week now is I will announce my, pot, uh, my live streams next week. And if you go to my LinkedIn profile or you follow me on Twitter and you ask questions on any of those platforms or Facebook, I will pick the, all of those up beforehand and I will try to answer them. If you have an, asked any questions in the live stream, I will do my best to answer them. So I will spend some time over the next few days going through all the comments in the live stream and answer them. Um, so let's move to the next trend, which is um, cloud computing and edge computing. Basically, this means we now have 
more computer power and we have this ability to store unlimited amounts of data and process them something we never had before cloud computing basically means that we are storing and processing data in connected on connected computers usually these are managed by someone else by cloud storage providers so if you take a snapshot on your on your Apple phone, on your iPhone, this goes to the iCloud. This is basically cloud computing because this is photograph is stored on a computer that is run by Apple or some of their providers. And I've recently written about all the major um, cloud computing providers. So the, the key ones are Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Oracle, IBM, and Alibaba. And they are all providing companies with cloud computing and cloud storage. In the past, it was mainly about storing data, but cloud computing has moved on. So modern cloud computing is all about artificial intelligence. It's about automating. Um, it's about running applications on the cloud. Um, so if you are thinking, oh, I would like to try out blockchain, many of the cloud providers now give you an application. So you have your data already there. If you then want to try out blockchain technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence, they will have apps for all of this. Um, again, I've recently interviewed a, a few people from IBM, from Oracle, from Microsoft about cloud computing. There's lots of um, of these interviews are now on my channel, on my YouTube channel, so dive into that. Basically, what we're now seeing is a world where cloud really has become intelligent. And it's not just that you need to have your data stored somewhere in someone else's data center. If, if there are regulatory requirements, if you're an insurance company or bank and you're not allowed to, to store your data in a U.S. or on Indian um, um, cloud storage data, uh, data center, then you can also have this on-premise. So you can have the same technology still managed by external providers, but on your own turf, in your own organization. And so what we're now seeing is we're seeing on-premise, we're seeing off-premise, we're seeing multi-cloud environments where companies have different providers and they're all starting to talk to each other increasingly. And we have hybrid cloud, so the, a mix between public and private cloud. And what is really exciting is that these cloud databases are becoming more intelligent. So I've recently talked to a company that spent years fine-tuning their, their data center that they were running in-house. They needed lots of people to manage this. They've now outsourced this to a cloud provider that runs artificial intelligence and automated algorithms to, to optimize the data and clean the data by itself. And within 24 hours of running their algorithms, they were fine tuning this data automatically better than what the company was doing with their own data center over the last five years. So this is quite exciting. The other exciting area is running applications on um, on the cloud. So you now have um, things like Office 360. So Microsoft um, runs this all on the cloud. We've got Google Documents running on the cloud. Salesforce, the marketing software, runs on the cloud. And um, what is now exciting is in the past, we basically outsourced our computing power to the cloud. So we would send things like, um, like so if, if i for example use my phone and say hey siri where's the nearest oops she is not answering where's the nearest um petrol station what would happen is that it would then send my voice recording to the cloud and apple it would then get processed there what we now have is what we call edge computing where the computing power of devices is getting smarter so instead of my phone sending it to the cloud it is now processing a lot of this machine learning and AI on the device. So um, things like, like security cameras. In the past, they simply streamed 24 hours of recordings 
to a data center where the data was recorded with some more intelligent edge computing it can actually detect when it is worth recording something because only when there's real activity when when there's something suspicious happening so more and more of our devices are now becoming intelligent and have more of this processing power on board um let's have a look at everyone i've got daniel salut back to you i've got Jamo from Muscat, really good to see you on the screen. Um, Emin, Karen, Manish, Paul, Daniel, Dirk, really good to see you all here. Um, again, let me know where you're from and I'm super happy to, to give you a shout out. Let's go to the next trend. So my fourth trend for today is digital twins. And this is basically where we, are create, where we create a digital copy of a physical product or a physical process or an ecosystem so that we can run simulations on it and make changes and see how those changes work. So um, one of the largest spectator sports in the world is motor racing, in particular Formula One. I live very close to the Red Bull racing team here in Milton Keynes, and um, they are now using a lot of digital twin technology. So they are, instead of creating a prototype, which they did in the past, a physical prototype, and then they would put this in a wind tunnel and test it all nowadays, they do no longer have a wind tunnel because their simulation software is so good that they simply create a digital twin of their car and then they use a digital wind tunnel to make fine tunes to their car. They can lift the spoiler up and down a little bit. They can make tiny little tweaks and see what this does to the performance of the car. In addition, we now have digital twins of entire tracks that allow them to simulate tire wear and everything else so we this is is, is super exciting and, and even cities like Singapore they now have a digital copy of their entire city which they're refining day in and day out and this allows them to simulate um, emergencies for example or it allows them to um, to understand how the city is being used and where to place certain services and infrastructure. So digital twin is super exciting um, and another key trend that, that I talk in my book. Um, Kevin, you say Ferrari, yeah. <laughs> Ferrari is also a very good Formula One team. I've got a Dimesh from Sri Lanka. Uh, Nazul, Nazgul from Berlin. Hello, ich komme komm auch aus Berlin. <laughs> um, then we have Jerry, we have Mao, Zhao, we have Hemat. Um, really good to see you all here. We've got uh, Bird from India. Okay, let's talk about my final trend, which is natural language processing. This is basically the ability of machines or of computers to understand human language. So this gives machines the ability to do things like read, edit, write, or even run our voice interfaces. So they can understand our language and they can also generate. Sometimes we differentiate between natural language processing, the ability to understand it, and natural language generation, which is creating an output. And there are companies, again, that I've worked with for a long time, like Narrative Science. They have the Quill platform that is a, a, a natural language processing tool. Other companies like Amazon have their Poly, um, Augmented Insight, another really powerful company. They have their Wordsmith tool, or Google has their text-to-speech tool. And these are all natural language processing and generation platforms. And for me, a really good example is, is Google Translate. So if you want to translate anything from one language to another, you just type into Google Translate, it will understand it and will even translate it. We now have automated journalism. So um, newspapers like the Washington Post, for example, they created their own Helograph, um, Helograph 
um, natural language processing tool that allows them to write articles. It allows them to even do research. Um, and, and Bloomberg, for example, they have the Cyborg tool that will now write articles on the earning reports of companies. So, and this is completely automated. And even if it's not automated 100%, it can help. So companies like the, the German Commerce Bank, for example, they use this now in their, in their analytics. So if, if in the past, they basically used an equity analyst to write these equity reports. Nowadays, 75% of what an equity analyst used to do in the past is now completely automated using machines. Um, companies like Alibaba, the, the Chinese uh, e-commerce giant, uh, is now using natural language generation to automatically create product descriptions. So if you are uploading something on the internet, it will optimize, it will describe what product uh, you're, you're putting onto that. And um, a tool that I use a lot is Grammarly because I write for different platforms and slightly different styles and different languages. And sometimes before I publish anything, I will run this through Grammarly that will, again, correct any spelling mistakes. It will look at grammatical mistakes. And, and there is a difference between English English and American English in terms of punctuations and where you put things. And, and I could go through all of this myself or simply automate it, which I do. Another really cool tool is the AI Writer. I don't know whether you've seen this. This is basically a, an artificial intelligence driven tool. You simply give it a headline and it will go away, do the research for you and write an article or a blog. So it won't do the, it won't be perfect yet, but it probably speeds up the process. So the company says about 33% of time you can save by starting with this product because it will do the research for you. It will pull together a really good draft, which you can then edit and finalize. Um, Hamad from India, hello on the stream. Helka from Finland, really good to see you. I've got Jaffa from Saudi Arabia. Ibrahim from Germany and Owen from San Francisco. Really good to see you all here. Um, so hopefully this has given you a, a real flavor for the, the next five trends that I include in the book. Obviously in the book, there's a lot more detail on my Forbes um, um, side, you can you can read about all these technology trends on my uh, YouTube. You can watch a lot more videos on all of this. What I want to do now is to try to answer some more questions. Uh, so feel free to 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 put them in here. Lots of shout outs here. I've got Nosfilo Filio from New York. I've got Leanne from Australia. I've got Ward from France. Um, so let me know if you have any questions. Um, I've had one question here come in from Ellie on Twitter. And Ellie was saying, businesses don't move to pick up technology unless there's a strong financial or competitive gain. How do you encourage businesses to adopt, the, uh, adopt this fourth industrial revolution? Um, really good question. And I couldn't agree more unless there is a real business case you don't want to look at any of these technologies. So for me, whenever you are thinking about using any of the 25 technology trends I talk about in the book, you have to reflect on your own business strategy to say, okay, what are we trying to achieve? And how can this technology make us more efficient, make us more money, make our customer service better, make us more competitive? So you have to start. And this is exactly what I do when I work with, with companies. So when I work with organizations and their boards, this is exactly the starting point where we say, okay, what is your strategy? What are your biggest strategic goals? And then we explore how technology can help you. There will be lots of technologies that are that might not be relevant to you at all. Um, in, in my book, I talk about gene editing, for example, as one of the big trends. This is probably not relevant for many. Blockchain is something that 
you probably need to monitor and think about unless you're a financial services firm where it has much bigger implications. But something like artificial intelligence, big data, um, they are trends that are so huge that every company will have endless possibilities of applying this technology. But again, it has to start with your strategy. So once you understand your, your strategy and how you could use some of those tools, then you make a business case for, for each of them and then you start using them. So you're absolutely right. What I see, however, at the moment is that this current situation that we're in, in with a global pandemic, that this has fast tracked this digital transformation. So my book, I believe, has never been more relevant than, than today because suddenly companies needed to think about cloud. So we've seen this uh, with companies like Zoom, for example. They, they suddenly saw a massive spike as everyone needed video conference calls. Um, and luckily, they're product is on the cloud and this enabled them to scale it up, scale it down as demand goes up or goes down. So all of these technologies for me have become increasingly important. And what I'm seeing is that I'm busier than ever trying to help companies to put in place the right strategies to use all of this. Karen, yeah, you say you need to check out some of these trends. That's good. Um, can you give us your links, Jean? Yes, so the links, um, if you simply Google my name, Bernard Ma, you can find my YouTube channel, you can find my own website at bernardma.com or you, where, where I share all, all the information or if you simply Google my name and put Forbes in, you will see all my Forbes articles or you can find me on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or any of the other social platforms. Oh, Jenny from Milton Keynes. Hi. Do you use the food bots? I do, um, Jenny. Thank you. So um, one of the, the, the fast tracking of digital transformation is robots and robot delivery. So for companies, the, the less you rely on people, the more resilient you are to a global pandemic. And when people stopped going to shops and they found it difficult to get online delivery slots, they started using robots. And we are lucky. I live in Milton Keynes, where we now have Starship robots. They are completely autonomously driving little robot pods that deliver my shopping. They deliver from local takeaway restaurants and so on. And I can even have my Amazon parcels delivered to them and then decide when I want the robot to bring it to me. So I this has become a complete part of our normal life here. So when we sit on a Saturday night and I watch a movie with my kids, they would say, oh, Daddy, can we have some popcorn? Um, when I say we haven't got any, then say, just get the robot. And so this is, is has become a complete part of our lives and is something that um, they have, the demand for this has completely spiked as well. So that, that shows how, how this is helping um, I had a question come in from Mona. Um, um, I have always been thinking about the ways that AI can change teachers' jobs since I, I'm a part-time teacher. And natural language processing, um, in natural processing, natural language processing, is there a chance for, for learning and teaching new languages um, in any better way, an easier way? And, and can, can we use this to make ed education more relevant and even identify any dominant uh, intelligences in people? So for me, education is one of the areas. Healthcare and education are the two areas I'm particularly passionate about, where I feel digital transformation will make a real impact. And what um, I'm seeing in education, I'm actually a, a governor of, a, of, of, a, of a, a very large school where I see this. I'm also uh, working with um, universities. I'm on the Dean's Council for, for Lancaster Business School. And so I'm, I'm seeing the, the real impact of this technology and the impact on the strategies of schools and universities and education organizations. And for me, there are huge opportunities. What is interesting is that, again, hopefully this current pandemic where we have people, uh, all the pupils working from home using digital systems can actually improve all of this. So we can have 
tools like Grammarly I mentioned earlier that will automatically assess someone's punctuations and grammar. So instead of a teacher reading through everything, if you just want to check for grammar and punctuation, this can be automated. If um, we now have tools, especially around math education or language learning, that use artificial intelligence. So because they understand what you're saying, you can have a conversation with those tools and they will pick up your grammar, they will correct you, and they can automatically then adjust the levels that you and the pace that you need to learn at. At the moment, if we are in a language class, you can't just have a much faster pace for one student compared to another. You all try to move at an average pace where some people would be left behind. For others, it's a bit slow. If you do this uh, uh, with an AI-enabled tool, you can learn language so effectively. You can listen to yourself speak. It can record. It can correct you. And it can pick up what you're good at. It will analyze your grammar and then give you the um, the, the, the bits that you need to improve at. So huge implications. And then some of the other trends I talked about, like virtual reality, augmented reality, also huge implications for, for education. I've actually written a, a few Forbes articles on how education needs to change and what technologies are, 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 are transforming education. So if you if you look out for those, I've also recorded a, a video that you can, you can find on my YouTube channel. Um, Laurie from Florida, you are saying uh, applications of blockchain and cybersecurity. Again, huge potential to improve cybersecurity, um, also data privacy. Um, so the promises are there that I haven't seen too many real life use cases in this field yet, but they're definitely there. Um, Annie from Australia, yeah, I answered your question about the 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 fact that blockchain is using so much power. Hopefully that gave you a good insight. Um, I've got a question here from Raj Deira, um, Rajendra. Um, why is blockchain adop adoption not picking up yet? Um, so what I'm seeing is that, that lots of companies are realizing the promise of blockchain, but there are so many different competing platforms. No technology is perfect yet. And I think we'll still see a few years until this will all go mainstream. We're seeing lots of pilots, lots of experimentation, but some of the downsides are that there are that none of the blockchains are perfect yet, I think. And this is why it's not kicking off, not not taking off completely. Um, yeah, Karen, you're saying digital education is not now something you're interested in. How can it help solve students' problem like those that can't access Wi-Fi? Yeah, this is a obviously a, a big problem that we've seen that again we need to fast track this digitization. Um, if we can give pupils access to tablets. Again, I'm, I'm looking ahead a little bit. One of the, the technology trends I will talk about next week is 5G. And 5G will basically give us mobile internet speeds that are as fast, if not faster than Wi-Fi, even the fiber optic Wi-Fi that we have in our houses. So if we can give people phones or tablets with 5G enabled, they don't even need Wi-Fi. So hopefully the more people now have tablets and phones, they will have access to many of these apps and, and a lot of this technology. But absolutely we're seeing a big divide at the moment. The people that have access to this technology can accelerate, they can continue learning. Um, obviously, if you are in a household with three or four children and only one or no laptop and Wi-Fi, that makes it all extremely difficult. I couldn't agree more. Very good. Okay, as I said, um, I will bring this live stream to an end now. Next week, uh, I will talk about the next five trends. So I will talk about self-driving cars, 
robots, chatbots, machine vision, and 5G, very similar to today. Feel free, if you have any questions about any of those trends, stick them on to my LinkedIn profile, send me an email, contact me on Twitter, send me an Instagram message. I will pick all of those up. So self-driving cars, robots, chatbots, machine vision, and 5G, lots of super exciting trends. The other thing I've got coming up next week is a live stream with the chief technology officer of Goodyear. So this is on Wednesday next week. Again, you will see all the details coming up in my social channels. And we will be talking about how Goodyear is really transforming from a, a manufacturing company, from a tire company to uh, a technology enabled um, company. So this is super exciting. We will talk about the future of mobility and the, how they're using tools like artificial intelligence and big data and digital twins. So some of the things we talked about today. So make sure you tune in. Thank you so much for joining me, joining me in this podcast and feel free to ask questions. This makes it super exciting. So if you send me questions in particular before the event uh, on, on LinkedIn in particular, this works fantastically well. Look out for my posts announcing this or subscribe to my newsletter. I have a newsletter that goes out every Sunday. If you subscribe to the newsletter, I will always share uh, the, the upcoming events with you. Okay, thank you so much. You have a lovely day. Bye-bye.